Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. And thanks, Anthony, for having me. Um, so I'm here today to share with you uh, a project that I worked on with um, an old professor and a friend, um, an interesting line from the University of Oregon, Allison Kwok. Um, this was about two years ago at this point, but we, her and I were talking, um, and she wanted to apply for this research grant from Tallwood Design Institute. Um, so her and I were kind of brainstorming, like, what are our questions around uh, mass timber? And really the one that stuck with us was embodied carbon. Um, so she ended up getting the grant, um, and I supported her team as an advisor. Um, whoops. Um, yep, so our key question here was how do we account for the embodied carbon of cross laminated timber? Um, and we decided to focus on cross laminated timber in particular to kind of narrow the research field. Um, and also because there was there was a lot of buzz at that time around CLT and a lot of projects in the Pacific Northwest that were um, being designed under development or just recently constructed that utilize CLT. So that really spurred the, the research question. Um, and I, before I start, I do want to say that all of this research is free and publicly available on Tallwood Institute, Tallwood Design Institute's website. Um, there is a link here and I can put it into the chat window later on as well. Um, but again, the project team was Allison Kwok uh, from the University of Oregon, myself as an advisor role. Um, I am a program manager with Architecture 2030. I manage our education initiatives and I lead many of our embodied carbon initiatives. Uh, but for this project in particular, it actually wasn't, wasn't through 2030. It was kind of on my own time, just supporting Allison and this research, mostly just out of curiosity. Um, and then we had several student researchers. And I really want to give a hats off here to Hannah Zalewski. Um, she was the research lead. Um, she spent countless hours researching and compiling data and running our LCA work. Um, so real hats off to her. She's in the Masters of Architecture program at the University of Oregon. Um, and then Isabel Riviera was a PhD candidate. She supported this research. Um, and Hannah McKay from Cal Poly, who was actually doing a term at the University of Oregon, also supported in helping Hannah um, really in the data analysis part. Um, so anyway, what I wanna share with you today is we took a substantial amount of research um, and kind of compiled it into what we call these info sheets. Um, and I'll dive into that a bit later on. Um, and then we also took the information we learned from that and ran five projects and did whole building life cycle analyses on them. Um, these are five projects in the Pacific Northwest to kind of get an understanding of one, the tools available, the processes in whole building LCA, um, and to kind of quantify the impacts of CLT in particular. So I wanna start really quickly just with the info sheets. Um, and give a really brief overview to those. Um, so the intention for these was for it to be applicable to a wide range of people um, and a wide range of experiences with mass timber and cross laminated timber. Um, so we started with just background information on CLT. Uh, what is cross laminated timber? Um, where is it manufactured in the US and Canada? What are some of the really key benefits of it? And what are some of the innovations available now and kind of in the pipeline? The second portion of this was looking at design. So looking at current building codes, um, looking at the 2021 IBC code changes, how will that impact design and what will be available through those code changes. Um, we also compared CLT, DLT, and NLT. Uh, so cross laminated timber, dow laminated timber, and nail laminated timber. Um, we looked briefly at CLT and certification programs, and then also uh, looked at net zero design with CLT. Um, Alice and I, Allison and I both have a background in, in Passive House, so that was kind of where that, that interest came. And then a lot of this research, the bulk of this research in this last chunk was really on the environmental impacts. Um, so for people wanting to get into the nitty gritty of LCA and understand carbon impacts of CLT, um, we did a lot of kind of areas of study here, and I will say that this last one, so CLT and LCA knowledge gaps, probably the most important right now in this research. And um, as Jeff and Eric highlighted, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of information out there, but there's also a lot of knowledge gaps um, and information that we would need to know in order to make 100% you know, certain analysis or even like a fully um, data supported analysis. So that was something that was a key takeaway for us was just kind of acknowledging where in the industry we're missing data, um, where we need this knowledge in order to make educated choices, that kind of thing. 
Um, so again, all of this is available on Tallwood Design Institute website. Um, and that was a brief overview, but it's intended to write, provide information uh, for, a wide, for a wide audience. So the second portion of this analysis was um, a whole building LCA that we did on five different projects. Um, so just as a really quick refresher, I know we have a lot of LCA experts on the webinar today, but I wanted to give just a brief overview to life cycle analysis, especially for wood products. Um, so the first portion of it is looking at this product stage. What is the raw material supply? What are the manufacturing and production? Carbon emissions. Um, cradle to construction analysis would also include transportation to the site. Cradle to handover would, it would include the construction process. So what was the fossil fuel emissions burned on site in construction um, from you know, the various like tractors, that kind of thing, on-site construction processes. Uh, cradle to grave looks at the use throughout the building's life. Um, so for CLT in particular, this isn't necessarily as important um, because it's, it's pretty unlikely that you'll be replacing a CLT member during the life of the building. Um, but for other products, this, this plays a really critical role. Um, this also includes end of life, deconstruction, and disposal. Um, and then a really critical component here, if you're looking cradle to cradle, is this module D. So it's anything outside of A through C, um, which includes recovery, use, reuse, and recycling. Um, and I wanted to touch on this because, as you'll see later on, it does play a pretty critical role in the data you get out of LCA studies. So all of these stages have their inventory, which includes various inputs, um, so fuel, electricity, water, raw materials, and various outputs, so emissions, water emissions, solid waste emissions, that kind of thing. And um, in many LCA studies, you're given a variety of impact assessment categories, um, so global warming potential, um, primary energy demand, et cetera. Um, for this study in particular, we focused on GWP, which is often translated as a measurement of embodied carbon. So when I was putting together this presentation, and um, I have to say it's been a little while since I've looked at this, so it, was, it was kind of a refresher for me as well. Um, but I was trying to think, what, what do designers really need to know in order to do an LCA that utilizes a CLT project or a CLT product? Um, and I, I have to say, I don't necessarily have all the answers. I actually have a lot more questions, um, but I wanted to kind of share the key lessons that we learned from going through this process. So I will start with um, every whole building LCA and um, just an initial comparison, use two different tools. Um, so we used Tally and we used the Athena Impact Estimator. Um, for Tally, we used the 2018 version, which is significant. Um, and a key thing here is there's a lot of variations between these two programs. Um, and I should note there are other programs as well you could use. Uh, one click LCA is one. Um, there's many, many architecture firms have developed their own in-house carbon accounting tools. Um, so there's, there's a whole host of tools out there. These are the two that were available to us at the time. So they're the two that we used. Um, so I wanna start by highlighting just the variations between the tools, um, cause this, this does play a really critical impact in what you pull out of an LCA. Um, so starting just with the, the key data input, um, Tally uses the Gabby database, which is US specific. Um, Athena uses a combination of their proprietary LCI database, um, the US LCI database, and then the EcoInvent LCI database that um, Jeff uh, highlighted towards earlier. Um, for wood assumptions, they both make different assumptions for the materials that they have available for, I mean, CLT in particular. So within Tally, there's three different options. One is a very generic um, product, which is actually an average glue lamb LCA data um, that has been adjusted to reflect density differences between glue lamb and CLT. Um, but it takes essentially like an industry average EPD for that. Um, and then they have two product specific EPDs available from KLH, which is an Austria based manufacturer um, that's also available within the, the Tally database. Um, the wood assumption for Athena is they, they took a 2013 aggregate of LCA studies out of uh, Canadian CLT manufacturers. Um, so kind of an industry average within Canada um, for CLT in particular. Biogenic carbon, 
Um, I have to say, Jeff, thank you so much for, for taking, <laughs> taking this a bit off my plate because biogenic carbon is, is really a complicated and complex topic. Um, but I will say that Tally, especially the 2018 version, allows you to either include or exclude biogenic carbon. Um, so just a, you know, a really quick definition, and I included a, a Vimeo link here as well that was done by Tally that explains um, biogenic carbon and shows how to use it within their tool, which is an incredible resource, especially for designers that want to um, want to understand this a bit better. Um, but our understanding of biogenic carbon, it's the carbon sequestered and stored within the tree itself, um, and it's also the carbon released into the atmosphere either through uh, you know, if it's burned as biomass, um, if it is allowed to decompose naturally within a forest system, it's kind of a biogenic methane at that point. Um, it can be stored if it's reused as a building product for, uh, you know, 100 to 200 years. Um, it can be stored if it's within a capped landfill, that kind of thing. Um, but it's essentially the carbon within the material and the carbon released from burning or natural decom decomposition of that material. So when included, um, uh, Tally includes both the carbon stored in the wood product itself, as well as the carbon emitted um, at the end of its useful life. Um, when excluded, it doesn't account for carbon storage. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not an expert on LCA, and I would refer to Tally on this uh, if you have questions in particular. I think that Vimeo link is a really great resource as well. Um, Athena accounts for the carbon stored in CLT as a credit towards global warming potential, so it has a negative impact, um, and it also assumes that it's released at the end of its useful life. Um, whoops, biogenic carbon emissions during manufacturing are not included within the global warming potential for Athena. Um, and then for end of life, I'm just going to go through this quickly, but Tally and Athena both assume different scenarios at the end of the useful life. Um, for example, Tally here assumes that 14.5% uh, will be recycled, 63.5% is assumed to be landfilled, um, Athena 80% is assumed landfilled, 10% assumed recycled, etc. Um, so all of this just to really say that there's a lot of variation between the tools you're using, um, and it's important to kind of understand the back end of that, uh, whether it's the raw data input, how it handles biogenic carbon, what it assumes at the end of life, that kind of thing. So um, let's see, we wanted to understand what the implications of these variances were and kind of get just a base understanding between the two tools. Um, so the first thing we did was take, a, let's see, a 25 square meter um, section of CLT. So it's a five meter by five meter and 8.9 centimeter thick uh, portion of CLT wall and kind of run that through the programs um, just to get an understanding of the variation. So, when we ran it through Tally, um, this is assuming just the generic CLT option, and we included biogenic carbon. This is kind of the result we got. We got an overall carbon store. Um, when we excluded the biogenic carbon, we got you know, a pretty significant difference there. Um, and then Athena, also a pretty significant difference. Um, and again, this is really pulled from the assumptions that each tool takes into its analysis. Um, so again, not an LCA expert, and I'm happy to answer questions here, but um, this is kind of really base information of these tools, and I think just understanding, you know, the base inputs, data inputs, that kind of thing. Um, so, but a key takeaway here is that, you know, we don't really fully understand why these differences exist. Um, and obviously understanding those base inputs will help, but there's assumptions that it's kind of hard to quantify. Um, let's see. Oh, and I do want to say this is not including um, module D, which is anything outside of this scope parameter and includes uh, recycle re or reuse. When you do include that, it does shift your data um, pretty significantly. So you see, you see a pretty significant adjustment in Athena in particular, um, which again, Athena assumes that all carbon sequestered is released at the end of life, which kind of helps explain that difference a bit. So uh, we took this base understanding and we really wanted to apply it to different case studies throughout the Pacific Northwest. Um, that just happened to be, you know, who we had contacts with and projects that were either recently completed or under, under uh, development. Um, but I wanna just briefly share that and kind of dive into one in particular knowing I don't have time to dive into all of them. Um, 
We also wanted to look at a variety of typologies. So our first one was the BC Passive House Factory in um, Pemberton, British, British Columbia. Uh, this is an industrial building. Um, we looked at a single family residential building in Seattle, the CLT house. District office in Portland, this is uh, mostly commercial. Uh, Carbon 12 in Portland, this is mixed use commercial and residential. Um, and then we looked at a uh, Glenwood CLT parking garage in Springfield, Oregon. Um, again, don't have time to dive into all of these, but they're all you know, publicly and freely available at that link I shared. Um, but I'll just share kind of you know, base information what we pulled from this. So if we look at the district office in particular, um, just to give a bit of background information, um, this is five floors of office space, um, atop a ground floor of retail and a below ground parking garage. Um, there's several double hype office spaces. Um, the blue, they utilize blue lamb columns and beams for the primary structure. And the floors are three layer CLT panels with a three inch concrete topping. Um, the core walls and foundations are reinforced concrete. So this case study in particular was really just a structural uh, life cycle analysis. Um, but, and I should note for all of these, we assumed a 75 year lifespan. Um, so this one assumed a 75 year lifespan. Uh, this is just the basic information on it, but um, it was completed, I believe, in 2019 in Portland. Um, it's a pretty large building, so over 100 square feet, um, designed by Hacker with, you know, KPFF as a structural engineer, MEP, that kind of thing. So I won't dive into too much detail here, but um, base information. So what we found, um, and we looked at kind of this variety of inputs that you can put into Tally um, in Athena, so including and excluding biogenic carbon, including and excluding module D. Um, and you'll see variations between the two. Um, so just, you know, background information before we dive into this. Um, we assumed a custom transportation distance for both Tally and Athena of 320 kilometers um, for the glue lamb and CLT, uh, which was the exact distance from the CLT manufacturer, uh, DR Johnson, to the construction site. Um, we assumed a generic CLT within Tally and then for the concrete assumption, uh, it's assumed to be reinforced concrete with a fly ash or slag content less than 20%. Um, so again, this just really highlights the difference in accounting between the programs and the assumptions. Um, I can dive into more detail on this later, but I just, I wanted to highlight that in particular. Um, and as I noted earlier, there's also different um, EPDs available within Tally. Well, there's a, a limited amount, but there's three available you can choose. Um, so we, we use the generic CLT, we also ran this analysis looking at the two product specific EPDs, which are based out of um, Austria. So we ran one with the same distance uh, parameters at 320 kilometers um, to see how the product specific compared to the generic. Um, and then we ran that again with uh, the product specific EPD from KLH, assuming it was actually shipped from Austria. Um, and there's a, a breakdown on that. And all of these also include module D. So again, happy to answer questions on that later on, but um, to keep moving. So it became clear in the study that there's um, a variety of inputs that affect the outcome you'll get from these tools. Um, one thing we learned overall is there's also kind of a lack of consensus and a lack of data on um, pieces we know to be very impactful. And those are really the pieces that, that Jeff and Eric talked to early on, and that's kind of this A1 through three products, product stage. Um, so even before A1, like what are the forest carbon implications? That plays a really critical role, but it's not necessarily something we can account for today in design. Um, what is the impact of manufacturing and production? Um, that is something we can account for, but we don't necessarily have the data to use it within these tools. Um, so anyway, those, these two pieces in particular play like a really critical role um, and are really impactful in helping us make informed decisions. So I wanted to kind of focus on that in particular and again, just focusing on embodied carbon or global warming potential. So I wanted to, and this is outside the scope of this research project and more just based off of my own personal curiosity, but um, I wanted to know like, what can we understand about embodied carbon by understanding the timber manufacturing process. So diving into this timber manufacturing process, um, I'm gonna walk you through this a bit, but 
you know, of course there's forest implications that go back before this point, but the first step here really is harvesting the lumber, cutting it to length in order to ship it to the mill, actually shipping it to the mill. Um, from there, it needs to be debarked. It needs to be sawn into rough cuts. Um, it's then sorted by length and species. It's then stacked and dried, dried in a kiln, planed. Um, and for those of you that are into woodworking, uh, this is kind of a, a hand planer. I couldn't find a good icon of a mechanical planer, so apologies there. But um, anyway, it is then stacked, um, banded, and shipped. Um, and so this is just looking at the lumber manufacturing process and timber manufacturing. If we then look at CLT manufacturing, it is then shipped to a CLT manufacturer where it is often further dried, um, vertically finger jointed with a resin. It's arranged into um, alternating layers with a resin and then pressed and cut into shape with a CNC. Um, so for this portion in particular, I'm gonna focus on just the, the top row here, looking at just uh, you know, lumber manufacturing process. Um, Cause I know, er, or sorry, Mitch will talk to the manufacturing process after me. Um, but I think there's, there's really, oops, sorry, and then it's still stacked and shipped. But um, there's key takeaways from this lumber, pro lumber manufacturing process that I think are really impactful for decision-making within design. Um, so first, I wanna start by things that we know within this process. Um, we know that 16% of total manufacturing energy requirements are electricity-based. Um, and sometimes that's the debarking, sometimes that's done with water, but it's definitely saw the uh, sawing into rough cuts, rough cuts and then the planing process. Um, so we know 16% of total manufacturing energy requirements are electricity based, um, which opens up a huge opportunity for on-site renewable energy. And it also informs that the grid mix at the milling site has a big influence on carbon intensity. So when we're talking about procuring lumber and understanding this process, the key question we can ask is, what is the grid mix of the mill that you're getting your wood product from? Um, that will have a, a relatively significant impact on its, its carbon intensity. I also, we also know that you know, roughly 75% or so of total manufacturing energy is from this combustion-based drying process. Um, so that's drying the lumber to a certain uh, moisture content, which, which is usually done within a kiln. Um, and we know here that the kiln is either gonna be using fracked gas or wood residues that actually come from the sawing process itself. So it's pretty much on-site, it's an on-site material, it's often used. Um, we also know that some mills use a carbon-free alternative, which is just air drying. Um, so there's a various opportunities here, but the majority of mills use the wood residues because it's available on-site. Um, it's kind of a free input for them. So a key question here is what fuel is being used to dry the lumber? Um, and I think, let's see, as Jeff said earlier, you know, carbon is carbon, whether it's fossil fuel or wood residue, but um, obviously we try to wanna eliminate fossil fuel inputs as much as possible. Obviously air drying is the, you know, most carbon free option. Um, so just, just knowing that input can help you make an informed decision. And then I kinda wanna end on this point, which is how do we close the data gap? So we know that there's a really large variance from mill to mill in terms of um, its electricity consumption, the grid mix that powers that, um, the type of fuel they're using for drying the lumber within a kiln or not using if it's air dried, um, et cetera. And I think a really exciting thing is that individual mill managers actually have a really cute awareness of each mill's operating requirements. So they know the labor that goes into it, they know the land, um, capital, raw material, and they know the energy consumption of the whole process. Um, so here, getting transparency from each mill would really allow for mill-specific, if not product-specific EPDs and really accurate accounting. Um, and I think that's kind of a next step. So um, in order to get this transparency, really start asking for mill-specific or product-specific EPDs. Knowing that the data is available, it's really just getting it into the hands of designers. So I wanted to end with that. Um, again, whoops, this is a repeat slide, but um, the resources I talked about and can answer questions later on are freely available on Tallwood, in Tallwood Design Institute's website. Um, you're also welcome to email me if you have any questions. Um, with that, I will send it back. Thank you.